Hello, my name is Christian Wagner, and I'm the Militant Thomist. So today we're going to be getting into a very special work by St. Thomas. That's going to be his work against the Greeks, which is going to be his work against um, the Eastern, what we would know, know as today, the Eastern Orthodox. They didn't really speak in those terms. They mostly just spoke of the Greeks versus the Latins, which I prefer much better than talking about Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox, but that's just, uh, at this point, mere semantics. But before we get into that, um, please become a patron at patreon.com slash militant Thomist to get access to PDFs, resources, such as videos, articles, and um, join the extra Discord chat and become part of the team, some of my favorites. So I will, I will when you, when you're in there, type in, in the live chat, I'll say, hey, look, he's a patron. No minimum. Um, you, if you want to do a dollar, go for it. I appreciate it. And then also, um, speaking of Greeks, if you want to know Greek, then fluentgreeknt.com is your best option for that. It's going to teach you actually how to read Greek. None of this, uh, spend two years in learning grammatical, uh, declensions and all that stuff all that stuff that all the first year Greek students hated. I remember I did three hours a day. My my first semester in Greek, it was terrible. 75% of my class dropped out, spent a bunch of money. It was it was nightmare, nightmare. It was a lot of work, hard work. But with Fluent Greek, it's a lot different than that. It's self-paced. It's an online platform where you have spaced repetition of certain verses in Greek. And if you use the code militant at fluentgreeknt.com, you get 20% off. And you also can get a free trial just to see if you like it. It's very helpful. The uh, they, they sponsor the show. So show us some love. And then also um, go to christianbwagner.com slash shop. I have there the absolutely based Militant Thomist mug. And then also all of the books that I've reprinted. Beautiful books. Wonderful books. The best books. So let's get into his work against the Greeks right now. And one quick note before we get started, this is kind of like, think of it a helpful way of thinking about how this work is. Think of the Summa Contra Gentiles, except Gentiles, it's Greek Quorum. So Summa Contra Greek Quorum. So it's kind of like the Summa Contra Gentiles, but it's just against the Greeks. It's the same um, type of writing going on here. It's the same uh, style and um, order that you'll get there. So on the Catholic faith of the Greek fathers is what they call it. So let me expand. So there's part one and two. So right here, this was actually very important because during this time, they were prepping for the Second Council of Lyon. And St. Thomas was actually on his way to the Second Council of Lyon when he died. So what they were doing is they were preparing sort of the arguments on both sides when it came to debates over various things which Latins and Greeks disagreed upon. So this is a work which is really uh, the flourishing of that. And then you'll get similar sort of works happening around the time of um, the Council of Florence. But the Second Council of Lyon is kind of like Council of Florence, pre-Council of Florence, if you want to think of it that way. Because Council of Florence is a lot more popular since that was the union of the two churches. So uh, you have here um, St. Thomas expressing uh, Trinitarian doctrine. And in explaining uh, Trinitarian doctrine, he's really his whole end in this is to explain the whole scope of Trinitarian doctrine and then to bring it to bear on the the idea of the filioque and he deals with a few random questions here this is also another really cool one oh, this is actually in greek so you'll need to go to isidore if you want it in english so how the sole definition of the nicene council is to be understood as the unique and true possession of the faithful so that is really big when it comes to understanding the way in which uh, the filioque in the in the creed in the canonical question is um, in that so again more about the filioque 
kind of a guess in part one, you could say that he was setting forth some of the some of the preambles to part two. And then he's also dealing with random questions about blaspheming, about um, how the assertion that faith cannot be preached is to be understood, um, the ministering of angels, seraphim, stuff like that, certain angelic questions. But in the, in the first part, it is more general, where this is more specific in part two against the Greeks. So some filioque stuff, more filioque stuff, <clears throat> the Greek and Latin fathers when it comes to the filioque. And then right here, this is kind of where you'll need to be careful with uh, chapter 32 through <clears throat> 38 is that's where he begins to talk about the Roman pontiff. Uh, there are a great deal of uh, forgeries when it comes to this issue. And that's something that you just have to worry about when it comes to medieval petrology throughout the whole thing is that there are these certain forgeries. But again, a lot of these forgeries become a standard. They become almost universally accepted. For example, the famous, famous example, although I think there might be a case that this was actually written by him, is uh, pseudo Dionysius. When it comes to uh, St. Dionysius, uh, his works were apparently, according to some, not actually written by Dionysius, but was written by some, uh, I want to say, late 4th century, early 5th century. That is usually when they'll, when they'll date the work. Um, that, that's usually when, when they'll say that it was written. But we can have faith that it is a true uh, explication of the faith because this is accepted basically everywhere east and west. You have Maximus the Confessor using it. You have St. Uh, Saint Maximus the Confessor, that is. St. John of Damascus using it. You have the medievals um, accepting it in whole. So we can be very confident with that. So it's a similar way a lot of times with some of these um, pseudo writings that that occur, some of some of these forgeries. So in a sense, you have to be careful that you're not using them for how they're not supposed to be used since they are forgeries. You can still use them as a true expression of the Catholic faith. But when it comes to uh, specifically citing an author as believing this, it can get a bit sticky. So here we have, when it comes to, he is superior to the other patriarchs. Very interesting. That to be subject to the Roman pontiff is necessary for salvation. And then 39, very important, not really. Against the position of those who deny the sacrament may be conferred with unleavened bread. And actually, interestingly enough, uh, if you read this section, St. Thomas's particular position is actually that it is licit to use leavened bread and that when you're a Greek, you practice as the Greeks, and when you're a Latin, you practice as the Latins. If you're in the West, in Rome, you use unleavened bread. If you're in the East, in Constantinople, you use leavened bread in your Mass. This isn't something which is um, a deal-breaker for him. And then question, I mean, chapter 40 is about uh, specifically um, purgatory. So part two is a little bit more useful if you're going to directly just want bam, bam, bam. But Part one is still important because it's setting up some of the uh, prolegomena to arguing in part two. Okay, so it's a great resource. I'm going to go to Isidore to kind of maybe read a chapter to show you guys. Well, go over a chapter to show you guys how his style works in this. Why can't I? F oh, there it is. Contra res grecorum. There you go. So this is an interesting one. How the assertion that even the New Testament is a death-dealing letter is to be understood. So further difficult arises from a text of Athanasius in the letter to Serapion. This is a death-dealing letter. From the beginning and before all ages I was created, etc. And he adds many illustrations from the Old and New Testaments. The letter, however, of the New Testament does not seem to be death-dealing. For thus it would not differ from the letter of the Old Testament, about which 2 Corinthians 3.6 says that the letter kills. But a correct formulation should be 
should say that neither the letter of the New Testament nor the letter of the Old kills, except occasionally. Occasion of death, some take in a twofold sense. In one sense, insofar as the sacred text is an occasion of error, something common both the letter of the Old as well as the New Testament. Hence, St. Peter says in his second letter that in the letters of St. Paul, there are some things hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do not understand the scriptures. In another way, insofar as the precepts contained in Holy Scripture become the occasion for evil living, concupiscence being intensified by its prohibition when help and grace is not given. In the same way, the letter of the Old Testament is said to be death dealing, but not the letter of the New. And then... Again, he's explaining this text from Athanasius. This is a lot of what it is. I mean, on the faith of the Greek fa fathers, I don't know why the this assertion of the New Testament being a death-dealing letter. I, was, I guess there's some sort of obscure medieval um, debate over this. But he might just be grabbing difficulties from, from uh, the Greek fathers that certain Latins were saying like that the Greeks were dumb. Because this is a bit of an obscure section. Section two is a little bit, part two is a little bit different. This is really where he, he begins to uh, compile stuff. So that the son sends the Holy Spirit. So it's likewise on the authority of Holy Scripture. Bam, bam, bam. Athanasius is, confesses the same as discourse in the Council of Nicaea. Bam, bam, bam. Same Athanasius also says, bam, bam, bam. Nice, Nicetas commenting on John says, bam, 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 Athanasius, bam, bam, bam. So this is what he does. He just collects a lot of quotes and then also gives forth scholastic arguments to kind of make a compendium or like handbook for the, um, for the Latins to be able to argue against the Greeks. So, and to resolve some difficulties as we saw. So, that's all that I got for you. Thank you for watching and do penance. Looking forward to it for the kingdom of God as at hand. Glory.